Okay, so welcome to week number five. The beautiful mind states is my current practice. It's what I've been working on. And most people, well all people who have a regular meditation practice, you should be working on something all the time. So those who are experienced yogis, usually we can say to each other, what are you working on? And they'll say, I'm working on my anger, or I'm working on my frustration, or I'm working on my loving kindness. So everybody should have a topic that they're, they're, is their current topic for something to develop. Meditation in Nepali is called bhavana. And the word bhava means to become or to make become. So bhavana is uh, usually translated as to develop. So the word the Buddha used was this concept of developing certain qualities. And the idea is that certain qualities will take you towards enlightenment and certain qualities will take you away. Now this is a more revolutionary teaching than you might imagine. One of the difficulties with the people who have become enlightened, and there are many, one of the difficulties that they have is that the state or the thing that they've attained to is their own real nature that was there all along. It's not something that you can develop and add onto yourself. It's not like you can be you and then you just add this extra little bit of salt and now you're just beautiful. Because anything that you can add on to yourself or gain for yourself or develop for yourself, that's something that has arisen, right? Because it wasn't there previously. If it's arisen, it's going to cease. That's the rule of the universe, the rule of samsara. So the people who have attained to enlightenment, they say, well, you don't have to do anything because it's, it's already there. It's not something that you can do to make it become and make it arise because that would just be another temporary thing. So they get stuck in how to describe the path. So many of them, they have no answers. I was looking at Papaji, one of my favorites, because I met him in India. And this young boy goes to him and says, I want to meditate, but I can't stop thinking. And Papaji really has no answer for this question. Because the difficulty is, you can only tell people what to do. And anything that you're doing is just creating something. And of course, that's just arisen and it's going to cease, so that's not it either. So there's this tremendous difficulty of people in the Enlightenment traditions of being able to teach or inspire or lead other people to the same experience. So the particular quality of a Buddha as opposed to an enlightened person is they are able to teach the path. Whereas other enlightened people aren't. They can only say, well, it's right there, it's your nature, or don't do anything. And you're like, well, I haven't done anything the entire time I was at university, but I didn't get enlightened. <laughs> so the Samma Sambuddha is able to put together a teaching to say that actually there are certain qualities that you can develop and those qualities are not enlightenment itself, but they are qualities that will lead you towards enlightenment. And the key function of these qualities is they are able, they are stabilizing practices. They stabilize the heart, they stabilize your being. And it's only from a point of a very stable, self-recollected, point that you can attain to enlightenment. For example, taking on basic moral 
conduct, something that I probably should have talked about the first week. But A moral conduct is something that straightens out the heart, stabilizes you. By living in a slight, in a immoral way, and it doesn't have to be deeply immoral. No one here is a deeply immoral person, but in a, even in a slight way, will tend to be a destabilizing effect. Look at people who drink alcohol. You know, if you drink a glass of wine with your husband or your wife once a week or something, that's unlikely to really affect you as a human being. But if you drink several pints of beer every day, that's, that affects you. You can see it in those people over 20 years or 30 years. And if you're doing the practices and you're keeping yourself steady, these will tend to make you more stable, more steady. The Buddha had a very nice, simple story for this. He said, imagine a king who wants to make a chariot and he comes to see the wheel maker and says, please make me a couple of wheels for my chariot. How long will it take? And the chariot maker says, six months. So the king comes back in six months time and only one of the wheels is ready, which just goes to show that even 2,500 years ago, everything was exactly the same as it is in the current modern day. And he says, where's my other wheel? The chariot maker says, oh, you can have the other wheel. The king says, how, how long is it going to take you? He says, well, it can take me two days. It can take me six months. And the king says, well, make it for me in two days then. So the king comes back in two days and there is the second wheel, completely identical to the first wheel. And the king says, why does it take you six months to make one and two weeks to make the other? They're exactly the same. And the wheel maker says, no, they're not exactly the same. And he takes the second wheel, he rolls it down the road, and as it runs out of energy, wobbles to the left, it wobbles to the right, and eventually it falls over and comes to a stop. Then he takes the wheel that took six months and he rolls that down the road. And as it runs out of energy, it doesn't wobble to the left, it doesn't wobble to the right. And when it comes to a stop, it stops dead upright in the words of the Sutta, as if it was stuck to an axle. He said, that's the same as somebody who is practicing morality and someone who isn't. When any kind of crisis comes, then if you are not stable and steady, you'll, you will fall over. But it also applies to the meditation. When we're slowing down and bringing the mind under control, under observation, your mind will be very wobbly if you're not living in a way that promotes stabilization of the mind. That is, if you're always thinking, if you're always wanting, if you're always disliking things or liking things, if you're pushed around by the things of the world, it's too hot, it's too cold, I want this, I don't want that, then when you sit, your, your mind is going to carry on in exactly that same way that you've trained it. Just a straightforward law I would call psychodynamics, law of psychology. I don't like to say psychology. But. So there are certain other things that we can develop that will also stabilize the mind further. One of them is loving kindness, which we focused on last week, but all of the positive mind states. If you can stop and take time to deliberately develop them, these will have a very stabilizing effect on your being. And I first noticed this in England where I lived in a haunted monastery. Many people had seen this ghost, Madame Baddington was her name. And she was, uh, I think she was a Protestant in Queen Mary's era, which was the bloody Queen Mary, uh, who was a strong Catholic, trying to wipe out the Protestants. And she was imprisoned in the farm tower and starved to death. But she took her ring and she scratched a verse from the Bible on the glass in the window of the tower. And you can still go up and see this verse that she, I can't remember what verse it was, but 
that she scratched in the glass, so you can still go up and see it. After she died, they uh, carried on insulting her because they chopped her body up into pieces and scattered it around the fields. Then when the government changed again and the Catholics were no longer out of vogue, somebody collected up all the bones, put them into a small coffin and put them into a tomb that was cut into the hillside. And you can still go down and see that tomb right now. So, many people had seen Madame Baddington. Some Thais came along and the Thais, they like to go to uh, Norway and then they fly over to Newcastle because at that time Newcastle had the biggest shopping centre in Europe. <laughs> so the Thais would come over for that reason and pop into the temple on the way. And they went walking around in the afternoon and then they met the monks early in the evening and said, we saw this funny little woman outside with the white thing around her neck. What is that? Well, you know, the Elizabethans, right? They would wear these big collars around their necks and we all, our hair is standing on end. They met the ghost but didn't even know it was a ghost. Apparently she's a deva, she's not a ghost, but a tree deva. So, me being Jack the Lad, I thought, I know, I'm going to test out my meditation, make sure that I don't fall asleep tonight when we have an all-night meditation. I'm going to go and meditate in front of that shrine, in front of that tomb. <laughs> it's pitch black. And I walked out onto the hillside and I was going down these steps and the steps are very ancient and wobbly and incomplete. And as I was going down the steps, I thought, you know, I might not go in front of the tomb, but only because the steps are probably a little bit dangerous. <laughs> so I thought I did my meditation above the tomb. Now, I'm ashamed to say that my whole life I have been terrified of ghosts. It's not a logical thing. You might say to me, they don't exist, there's no proof. You know, I, I, I've never seen a cold virus, but I've had plenty of colds. Whether they exist or not is completely missing the point. The point is you have a fear of them. And my argument to myself is, well, they, ghosts may exist, but they've never actually interfered with me in any way. I, I've never felt them. I think I may have seen a few, but... So, you know, I've seen plenty of things that didn't interfere with me. I'm not afraid of them. But there I am sitting on this hillside in the pitch black middle of the night and my hair is standing on end. And you know my one thought that I had in my mind was... I haven't been a bad person. And that was my way of saying, universe, don't come and attack me with ghosts because I'm actually quite a good person. Being a meditator, I'm observing these thoughts as they come up and I'm interested. I'm like, why is, where does that feeling come from? Anyway, I stayed up there for a few hours and then I gingerly kind of crept back before any ghosts noticed me. What I did hear the story of was in the monastery, if you are a, like a novice, you dress in white. And one day there was a monk who decided to conquer his fears and go down and do his meditation in front of the tomb. And he went down there and he was terrified, but he overcame his fear. And while he's doing his meditation there in front of the tomb, one of the novices walked out dressed in white. <laughs> Do you know why ghosts wear white sheets? It's not a joke. Do you know why that is? Huh? This comes from Sigmund Freud. I just read um, Dream Psychology. I know you don't like Freud very much. It's just natural. <laughs> and Freud said, you know, the reason that you're, that you're afraid of ghosts is because you experience your family and parents coming into the room at night but your brain faculty isn't there computing enough to understand what's happening. So what you see is this, your parents or your nanny or your somebody dressed in their nightgown coming into your room. But while you're half asleep, it's just a presence or a glimpse and then this overwhelming fear because you don't know what it is. And that's how it came about that ghosts wear white sheets. It sounds quite plausible to me, but... 
So, the, there are certain states that you can develop which are conducive to this great accident of enlightenment. And all the positive mind states fall into this because they will stabilize you and give you confidence. The other set of mind states that will do this are what I call disenchantment states. And I love this word, disenchantment, because I love fairy tales. And I love the idea that someone casts an enchantment on you means that you can't see what's real, you can't see reality. And that the path of meditation is waking up, so you start to break these enchantments and start to see what's really happening. And the whole path of Buddhism was centered around this concept, it's called Yoniso Manisikara. Yoniso means wisdom, Manasikara means attention. So, for example, within this room right here, right now, you can place your attention on different places, right? Probably I'm somewhere in your attention. So your attention can move around the room onto different things. You can attend to the floor, the tiles, the camera, the speaker, the microphone, yourself, your knee, your foot, another person. So even though you're all in this room, what seems to be the same experience. In actual fact, what you are bringing your, into your attention is different. So that when the Buddha gave this teaching, Yoniso Manasikara, <coughs> he's saying that certain things, if you pay attention to them, are more conducive to wisdom, stopping still, dispassion and enlightenment than other things. So, for example, if you, pay, if you put your mind onto something that you really want. I had no lunch today, I really want a bagel. If I start thinking about it, what happens? I start to generate that desire, that want, that wish. My mind will start to take on that characteristic. If I put my attention onto something else, onto the Buddha image, then I start to feel more peaceful, more happy, and more inspired. Paying, atten paying attention to what you pay attention to is important. Attention to certain things will create certain mind states. Attention to other things will create other mind states. And everything in the world has both an attractive quality and an unattractive quality. So, pizza, a few days ago, had a very attractive quality for me, because I hadn't had pizza in a long time, and right now, pizza company are two for the price of one. And they do good salads, pretty good salads. So, this was very attractive to me. Um, however, despite 20 years of being a monk, I am unable to bridle passion for the pizza once it arrives, and I ate both of them. <laughs> both pizzas, yes, and the salad, and a tin of tuna, and lentils, because I put lentils on the salad, and the DQ ice cream. <laughs> I'm not ashamed. After that, the thought of pizza is no longer attractive, right? So what is it? Is that pizza attractive or not attractive? Well, absolutely anything in the world you can view as attractive or non-attractive. You can view it either way. And one of the tricks that the Buddha gave, said what, somebody asked him, uh, what Psychic powers, what special powers do you think are worthy of development? And they have all special powers flying through the air, remembering past lives, multiplying your body into many, diving into the water, into earth as if it was water, flying off to see heavens and hells. All these kind of things were very commonly talked about, psychic powers, real or unreal. So the question was, well, which of these powers should a human being develop? And the Buddha said, the power that you should develop is to see the unattractive quality in the attractive. 
and to see the attractive quality in the unattractive. Interesting, eh? This is the greatest psychic power that he said you could develop. It really hit home to me one day. I was actually in a temple and Chinese New Year and we all the monks would get given jobs. We'd be dressed up in ceremonial robes. They actually counted it's 26 layers of cloth over the le left side of the body. And you're outside, no air conditioning. And you, you know, I would get a rash like over this whole side of my body because it's just all day sweat. A little bit unpleasant. I wasn't complaining, I was very mindful and I bore it with great... No, I didn't, I complained like a bitch and moaned the whole day long. <laughs> so I wasn't having a very happy time of it. Now when you ordain, you are given five meditation objects. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin. And these are the only mention of meditation given in the ordination ceremony. So here I was, Chinese New Year, I was covered in a rash, it's my third day in the row, and my job was to receive yellow buckets. So there I was, all day long on this, doing these ceremonies, and my drooping down and down and down. And then this really beautiful girl comes in to make the offering, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's cheered me up a little bit. And I was looking at her, and I was like, wow, she's a really beautiful woman. And then it just occurred to me, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin. And that's everything you can see of a human being. That's the whole external surface of a human being. Hair needs to be washed continually. It gets dirty and greasy. Skin definitely needs to be washed and cleaned constantly. Nails, teeth. So we're taught to view these five things in the unattractive aspect, so that when we look at a human being, we can look at them either way. And this breaks the attachment to lust and desire, so that we can live more peacefully and more at ease. So this was the teaching the Buddha was giving, that being able to switch your perception, pay attention to the right aspect, Certain aspects will increase your greed, hatred, and delusion. Paying attention to certain other aspects will decrease your greed, hatred, and delusion, and will stabilize you. So, the disenchantment practices are ways that you can develop your perception so that you become disentangled or disenchanted with the things of the world. If this enlightenment is actually real, our process is one of disentangling with the things that you can see, hear, taste, smell, touch, including ultimately your meditation objects. And being bringing your attention back to find that which sees, if you like, or the jitta, or the Buddha nature, however you want to call it. And so many of the enlightened people, they say, well, you just, just, it's just there. I saw, um, what's his name, Ajahn Brahmo, and he said to me, he told me to do a certain practice that I had just done in front of him. And he said, do that practice again. I said, well, I'll try. He said, no, no, you mustn't try. You're trying, you're not doing it. Exactly the same advice that Yoda gave to Luke Skywalker, right? Do or do not, there is no try. In this case, it was do not try, but do not do either. And my argument against Ajahn Brahmod, who is way up there, he's, he's as likely to be an enlightened arahant as anybody. But my argument against him is it's all right for him to say, well, you just sit and be and you're perfectly enlightened. Our problem is we are entangled with the things of the world. Our attention does leak out, does go out. We do get caught up in what we can see, hear, taste, smell, touch. We do get caught up in ideas that are really enticing and want to suck up your attention. I want to write films and I want to make caravans and hovercrafts. And I mean, there's, there's hundreds of things that really attract my attention. 
I want to learn about plasma physics. I really do. I want to understand electricity. But all of these things, these are our entanglements with the world. Now, that doesn't mean you have to give up everything if you have interests, so long as it's not a destructive interest. It's not harming you or someone else. I say, go ahead and do it. I have other interests than Buddhism. People always bring me books, you know. And they, every time they bring me a book, it's a book about Buddhism. I'm like, Can you bring me something else. Like, just because I'm a monk doesn't mean the only thing in the world I'm interested in is Buddhism. <laughs> if you're from England, I don't bring you only books about England, right? Or if you're, <laughs> if you're female, I don't bring you only books about females. So, just as a tip. <laughs> Next time you bring me a movie or a book, please don't make it about Buddhism. <laughs> so I would say have other interests uh, is a sensible thing for a human being to do. But the problem is that we are entangled with things. So these enlightened people who say, well, there's nothing to do and nowhere to go and just be enlightened, well, that doesn't cut it. And this is why I've always valued what I call the monks monks. The kind of monks that other monks look up to, which is not the flashy public speakers that lay people look up to. And those monks monks are not the ones who have all the great attainments. They're the ones who are willing to do the work day in, day out. The ones who go to the chanting, the ones who are kind to people, the kinds who work hard, the kinds who try make an effort. These are the ones that we really respect and admire. So, here the Buddha is saying that certain things that you pay attention to are better than other things that you pay attention to. And these are what we call Dhamma. I misspelt it the other day and I spelt it Drama. <laughs> That's a better word for it. You get caught up in all your dramas things people said to you, and your reputation, and your self-esteem, and all this kind of thing. So, certain things that you pay attention to will tend to decrease these tendencies. And those are Dharma. Some of the main ones are impermanence, which I'll talk more about next week. Another one is suffering and you pay attention to suffering, it starts to disentangle you from things. So you pay attention to the suffering in things, and there is suffering in absolutely everything. That doesn't mean that everything is only suffering. There's the beautiful side too. There's the fun and the beautiful and the attractive side. It's your choice on perception what you're going to pay attention to. So by paying attention to certain aspects of things, then you will naturally drop them. So how do we have something in the mind so we can pay attention to it? This is where the meditation that we're doing comes in, because you have to do it as a meditation practice first. And as a meditation practice, what we are interested in is only the thing that has just arisen in the present moment. That's all we care about. Don't care about your childhood, your future, your past, your health, your house, your mortgage. You have to pay attention to those things in the right way. <coughs> Don't cancel your mortgage repayments and say, well, this Buddhist monk told me to just live in the present moment. It's not sensible, right? Hopefully you wouldn't even think that. But in the meditation, you can feel that topic come up. Now, that topic is pulling on your attention. You're going to have to disentangle from it. So the thing that we're doing in meditation is practicing disentangling the mind from things. I'll repeat, that doesn't mean you don't pay your mortgage or look after your children or look after your health. It means right now you are practicing the ability to be able to disentangle from absolutely anything that has just arisen as a single experience. 
in order to be able to do that, what we do is we hold that thing in attention. And this is called, technical term, this is called Dhamma Vijaya. Dhamma, you know. Vijaya is, means to investigate. It's the same origin of the word as the Thai word for university. Vitiyalai comes from Vijaya. So Vijaya means to investigate or to look into things. But we have to be careful when we're looking into things. We're not looking into things psychologically, trying to work things out psychologically and trying to work out the psychological story and, well, I have to do all this work in order to let go of my parents and the way they treated me or my schooling. If you're going to work through resentment and history and past and neuroses and things like that, do psychology, that's fine. Get a therapist, read some books, self-help, go ahead. Personally, I like psychology. But this is not what we're doing with Dhamma Vijaya. With Dhamma Vijaya, what you're doing is holding the thing in attention, but not forgetting yourself. What that means is you're not getting caught up in the story. When the story comes up, that story and that feeling will have a chain reaction that will send you spiring down and you're caught up and you've lost the sense of yourself and you're embedded or buried in that story. So I have a little story to wrap up with. Some of you may have heard it before. This is a story of one time I was coming back from my university and just as I was leaving, one of the Indian students gave me this bag of Indian goodies. And I'm rather fond of anything that comes from India, especially dates. And I saw there's lots of dates in there and various Indian sweets. And I was quite looking forward to all of this. And so I got on the bus and I come back to Bangkok. It takes about an hour and a half. And as the bus comes to the final stop, what he's going to do, let everybody off the bus, but I know he's going to carry on and turn right. And I want to get off a little bit further along. And so if you just ask them, I'm going to get off, can I just get off around the corner? It's never a problem. So I go up to this bus driver and I say, you're going to turn right up here. Can I jump off on the main road? He went, no, huh. long seat, get off. Like, that was very unnecessary, I thought, that he was so short with me on this occasion. He didn't need that. I'm not asking for a big favour, but even if he doesn't want to grant me the favour, he could say, no, I'd rather you get off. I thought that was very, rather rude and unnecessary. And this lodged in my head, so I stomped off the bus. And you know what had happened? I'd left my bag of Indian goodies on the bus. And as the bus starts to go off, you see, it's quite a lot of traffic, it's not going very fast. And we monks, we're not allowed to run. But I know if I just ran a little bit, I could have caught the bus. So I was trying to walk fast but not run. And every time I'd get close to the back of the bus, it would go on, drive on a little bit further. And I was really racing down the road and annoyed at the driver and annoyed that I can't run. And eventually I saw my bag of Indian goodies go sailing off in another direction. I mean, do I get on a motorcycle? Do I chase him down? Tomorrow, is he going to leave from here tomorrow? Maybe he won't notice them there. I'm thinking, you know, I don't mind offering my bag of Indian goodies to anybody else in the universe except this driver, because he was <laughs> grumpy. Like, he does not deserve my bag of Indian goodies. <coughs> you see what's happening. There's a story that's come up, and I'm getting into that chain reaction. The chain reaction. He shouldn't have done this. I don't like him. He, he shouldn't eat my goodies. I'll give them to someone else. The story will pull you in and start to just motor you along. You are lost, you are caught in this uh, process. So, what do you do? Dhamma Vijaya. 
We don't want to work out the neuroses and the psychology of it. What we do is we hold that feeling in the attention. Indian good is driver. Hold it in, I'm not forgetting myself. How does it feel? Stop and look. Because usually bad things don't feel that bad. You think they do, they send you into a spiral, but actually, how bad do I feel? I'm remembering myself. Like, well, on the wide scale of things, I don't feel that bad, really. I don't need to get into that mechanism. As I'm holding it there, well, I can feel the suffering involved in it. If I throw myself into that story, I'm going to suffer. What if I just don't? What will happen to it? Am I suppressing it? Will it come and give me bad dreams? Maybe, but who cares about the future? We only care about right now. Holding it there, watching it. And what happens is, after a minute or so, it's kind of like, come, think about me, think about me, think about me. And you don't react. And then it disappears. Now, when you can watch the end of something, this will give you power over it. In all fairy tales, remember? Fairy tales like Rumpelstiltskin. How did the princess defeat Rumpelstiltskin? She had to find out his name. When you know the name of a demon in fairy tales, the demon can no longer have any power over you. So when I see this, like, well, this is just greed for the sweets, or I could label it as anger to the driver. And I've seen it and I know its name. I don't get pulled into the story. So that's Dhamma Vijaya. The idea is that whatever it is that's calling on your attention, your entanglement in the world, you need to be able to investigate it. Investigation of Dhamma. That means being holding it, but as a thing that's arisen in the present moment. And being able to turn your attention to certain aspects of it. Now, I've given you a negative example, and a positive example this one. One lady rang me up one day and said, um, I don't really want to go to work today. What do I do about that? Do you get people ringing you up asking you these kinds of things? <laughs> like, why ring me up? <laughs> well, sometimes I have to go to work or go to do things and I don't want to go either. But if it's a worthy thing to do or if I have to do it, you make yourself. So you make the necessary adjustments. And the adjustment in that case is, well, if you have to go to work and say, well, this is my duty, this is what I have to do, I'll look on the bright side of it. And I won't let myself get caught into the negativity of not wanting to do it. You can hold that negativity there and investigate it. And what I do is I say, I wonder if I just get up and go to work, how long will my negativity about that actually last? And what I find is, before I've even brushed my teeth, actually that whole thing is gone. So here's the trick. There's two things you need to remember or take away from this practice. One is breaking that chain. Breaking that chain of that cycle. You break the chain by holding it in awareness. Second point is, a thing will only ever stay in your awareness if you feed it with thoughts. These are little trolls that come into your mind. You know, internet <laughs> trolls, right? They go around and make nasty comments around on websites and web forums just to try and tweak people's nerves. And if you don't respond to them, they kind of just go away and annoy somebody else. So these are little trolls that come into your mind, if you don't feed them with thoughts, they go, they disappear, they go find someone else to bother. So holding it there is, I'm not going to think about you. Why is this bus driver like that? Maybe the bus driver's had a bad day. 
maybe I'm having a bad day, maybe I can find that same student and tell him that I didn't get his sweets and he can bring me some more. It's just feeding it with more thoughts, right? If you're going to disentangle from the world, feeding things is not going to work. What you need to do is hold it there and wait until it dissipates. Paying attention to the right aspects of things will help them to dissipate. If it's a very negative thing, pay attention to the attractive aspect. So if somebody's annoying you, pay attention to the fact they're a suffering being, or a worthy being, or that they don't actually want very much from you. Paying attention to the positive aspect will help to disentangle you. If it's a very positive thing that's arousing your greed, pay attention to the negative aspect of that. If you can switch between the attractive aspect and the unattractive aspect at will, because this is something that you've trained yourself, this is Dhamma Vijaya, investigation of Dhamma and disentangling from the things of the world. So this is what we're doing in the practice and in the meditation wise what you can do is if something's coming up fairly strongly you can drop your meditation object and just turn around and do the investigation of the state. <laughs>